I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker to you. Mr. Mike Chaplin was born in Penn Argyll and raised in Stroudsburg. He graduated from Stroudsburg High School, class of 1964, and enlisted in the Pennsylvania State Police in May 1969, where he graduated as the class speaker from the academy. He first served as a uniformed patrol trooper before being assigned as an undercover narcotics trooper. Mike continued in the major crimes organized crime department until becoming a corporal. In 1980, he was promoted to sergeant. Mike served at various stations in Pennsylvania, including the Swiftwater Station, where he served as commanding officer for 10 years. He retired in 1993 with 25 years of service. After retirement, Mike was a captain on a large turbine powered airplane for the US government contract company and flew missions for over five years. He owned an aviation company and holds an airline transport pilot certificate and is a certified flight instructor for airplanes, airplanes in all disciplines. Mike is currently the first vice president of the Pennsylvania State Police Historical, Educational and Memorial Center at the Pennsylvania State Police Museum in Hershey. On a personal note, I was happy to learn that Mike not only graduated with, but was good friends with my late mother-in-law. And I think uh, he and I are going to have to share some stories after today's program. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome Mike Chaplin, who will give us his presentation, The Origin and Evolution of the Pennsylvania State Police, 1905 to 1937. It is all yours, Mike. Take it away. Thank you very much, Amy. And uh, I would like to uh, say thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about the origin and the evolution of the Pennsylvania State Police which was the first uniformed state police in the country. Uh, we were founded uh, and signed into law on May the 2nd, 1905, but the reasons for the formation for our department actually went back a few years to 1902 during the Industrial Revolution. In those years, coal was the main source of power throughout the United States, and well, uh, uh, immigrants came from uh, Europe uh, looking for a new life. And uh, because they couldn't speak good English, uh, they were deemed to be unskilled. And one of the few places they could get uh, jobs was in the coal mines. Well, the coal mines were a very dangerous place to work with cave-ins, methane gas, uh, and uh, also a, a disease called black lung. The uh, methane gas uh, was determined uh, uh, if they would take a canary into the mine and the canary would fall off the perch, they would evacuate the mine. At any rate, in Northeast Pennsylvania, there was the largest deposit of anthracite coal or hard coal in the world at the time. Now these miners worked long hours and it was very dangerous. And they were overseen by a group of people called the Coal and Iron Police. Uh, coal, a mine owner could go to Harrisburg and for the price of $1, uh, swear a person in to be a coal and iron policeman. And they would supervise uh, all the miners and they were uh, thugs, they were criminals, adventurers and that type of thing. And they were uh, just bad people. And they beat the miners on many occasions, killed the miners. Uh, and finally, in May of 1902, the miners had enough and they went on strike. Uh, the strike occurred uh, mostly in the anthracite area, which is the northeast part of Pennsylvania. And it lasted until October of uh, 1902 when the Pennsylvania Guard, uh, National Guard was called in uh, to break the strike. At this point, uh, the president of the United States at the time, Theodore Roosevelt became involved when he uh, formed a commission after arbitrating the strike. He arbitrated between the mine owners and the miners and uh, got the miners back to work. But his, his question was, after everything was done, what caused the strike in the first place? And as it turned out, 
it was the treatment of the miners by the coal and iron police. So uh, President Roosevelt, as I mentioned, formed a commission called the Grant Great Anthracite Coal Strike Commission. And uh, they submitted a report to him in uh, March of 1903. In uh, 1903 also, January of 1903, the new governor took office. His name was Samuel Whitaker Pennypacker, and he was the 24th governor of the United States, of the, of the state of Pennsylvania, excuse me. Now, before I go any further, I would like to digress here a little bit. Uh, myself and another uh, retired trooper still teach cadets as part of the curriculum. Uh, and we, uh, there are six of us then that also give tours of the uh, the academy and the uh, museum and so forth and the campus. Uh, and a lot of these people, particularly the ca cadets are in their 20s. Uh, you can come on the job up until age 40, but because of the intensity of the program, most of the cad uh, cadets are in their uh, 20s. We speak to a lot of school children. So I want to address two questions that are commonly asked uh, by these young people. First, uh, I was not one of the original enlistees in 1905. And secondly, I never met Teddy Roosevelt. So at any rate, uh, it might be the gray hair. Uh, at any rate, uh, Teddy Roosevelt suggested to the newly elected Governor Pennypacker that in order to preserve the peace throughout Pennsylvania, he form a statewide constabulary. Governor Pennypacker agreed uh, and started to put a plan together, but uh, by April of 1903, the legislature uh, went on recess. In those years, the legislature just worked every other year, so they didn't come back until January 1905. Governor Pennypacker felt at that point that that was a good thing because it gave him time to plan for a statewide constabulary. The reason that uh, President Roosevelt suggested this is that uh, the only two uh, full-time police departments in the state at the time were uh, Philadelphia City P PD and uh, Pittsburgh uh, Police Department. The uh, rural areas were uh, overseen by sheriffs and constables and they were limited in scope by the boundary of the county. So uh, Roosevelt strongly believed that a statewide organization would be better able to uh, serve the people of Pennsylvania and prevent future violence. Well, uh, the legislature came back in 1905 and in March introduced, at the request of Governor Pennypacker, introduced Senate Bill 278. A Senate bill is kind of an idea or a thought, and then it's voted on by the Senate. So the uh, Senate introduced the bill to form a statewide constabulary uh, via uh, Senate Bill 278, and it was unanimously approved. It was then passed on to Governor Pennypacker for a signature on May the 2nd, uh, 1905. Governor Pennypacker signed it and it was enacted into law. And when it was enacted into law, it became an act uh, 227. So the Senate Bill 278 introduced our department and Act 227 formulated it on May the 2nd, 1902, uh, 1905. Now, as after the Senate uh, approved it and after the governor signed it, on uh, May the 2nd, uh, the governor, Governor Pennypacker, uh, addressed the legislature to thank them for uh, the support of the uh, creation of a statewide constabulary. And it was a rather lengthy speech, but the last part of it, I will quote. He said, I then looked about to see what instruments I possessed wherewithal to accomplish this bounden obligation? What instruments on whose loyalty and obedience I could truly rely? 
and I perceived three such instruments. My private secretary, a very small man, my woman stenographer, and the janitor. So I made the state police. And with that, uh, the Pennsylvania State Police was born. Now, the next thing that Governor Pennypacker had to do was find a person to lead this organization. And the name Captain John C. Groom kept coming up. He was a captain with the Pennsylvania National Guard, First City Troop, Philadelphia, 43 years old and uh, a military man. He was not a politician. So, uh, and he was a combat veteran. Uh, upon his uh, request to uh, serve uh, as the superintendent, Captain Groom turned down Governor Pennypacker's request. So Governor Pennypacker kept looking and the name John C. Groom kept coming up and Pennypacker looked throughout the whole state, uh, but Captain, Captain Groom uh, kept appearing at the top of the list. Pennypacker went back to Captain Groom and asked him a second time. And uh, Captain Groom said, okay, I'm not a politician. I will not allow any politics in this organization at all. I do the hiring, I do the firing, and I set the rules and regulations. Governor Pennypacker was elated. So Groom accepted the job uh, at this, on the second request if he takes the task of organizing the state police, there will be no place in the force for political henchmen, ward politicians, or wire pulling. That's exactly what uh, Governor Pennypacker wanted. And he said, if I cannot uh, run this on this plane, I shall turn the commission back over to the governor to dispose of as he pleases. Now, at this point, I'd like to digress a little bit. Um, I'm also the son of a Pennsylvania state policeman. My dad was, uh, was a trooper. When I applied for the uh, state police in the 60s, uh, and this is to prove that there, there really is no political affiliation at all with this department, and it's still that way today. Uh, when I applied uh, in the 60s, uh, there were five of us who were sons of troopers in the northeast quarter of Pennsylvania. I was the only one to make it. Now, normally per class, uh, we get uh, 8,000 applicants for 100 to 150 slots uh, in the academy after you go through a litany of uh, a variety of things that takes 10 months after the written test. But I was the only one to pass the test and the other four didn't make it. Uh, Groom super, served as superintendent uh, for 15 years, but he was actually uh, called to active duty uh, in 1917 uh, to go to uh, World War I in Europe. And when he came, uh, when he came back uh, in 1920, then he, uh, he resigned his post. Now, after uh, Groom was appointed, his next function, because he was not a policeman, he was a soldier. Uh, his next function was to learn about the various police departments. So he went to Europe and studied a variety of English and uh, uh, Scottish, Irish uh, police departments along with Switzerland, Spain, and several other countries. And he returned in July of 1905 uh, and uh, decided that he was going to form our department uh, in line with the Royal Irish Constabulary. Uh, the Royal Irish Constabulary uh, was uh, uh, exactly what he wanted. They had troops, they had good rules of discipline, uh, they had good rules of regulation, and they were uh, very professional. So we are formed exactly as the Royal Irish Constabulary. Now, after Groom got back, he also went to Canada and studied the Northwest Mounted Police for a short time. That's now RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, uh, but uh, took some thoughts, but uh, really we were formed in line with the Royal Irish Constabulary. 
Now, in the beginning, um, the Pennsylvania State Police was authorized by legislature for 10 men per county uh, to patrol 45,000 square miles of Pennsylvania on horseback. Um, 10 men per county, 67 counties at 670 troops. Uh, but this was whittled down because there was a lot of uh, resistance by the labor unions. They were afraid that we were gonna become an, a, a statewide coal and iron police. They also thought that our department was just gonna be strike breakers for the governor. So the original complement of the Pennsylvania State Police that were assigned to four troop headquarters was 228 men that patrolled on, on horseback. Now, Troop B uh, in the northeast quadrant of the state was formed in Wilkes-Barre, later moved to Wyoming, and actually just last year uh, moved back to Wilkes-Barre again. Uh, Troop D in Punxsutawney uh, was in Jefferson County. Troop A in Greensburg was in Westmoreland County. And Troop C in Reading uh, was in Berks County. Now, the reason that Groom picked these locations was it was where the railroads intersected. So if he had to move men and horses and equipment in a hurry, in a hurry for those days, uh, he could load them on trains and get them to various areas of the state fairly quickly. Um, now, in 1907, uh, he got another idea about forming substations. Substations radiate out from the troop headquarters like spokes on a wheel. So he was deliberate, deliberating this idea. He thought it would make the state police more efficient, but he wanted to have a pilot program first to see if it would work. Now there are now over 70 stations in the state, uh, but he wanted to start with just one in 1907 to uh, to see if the uh, to see if it would work or not. And he formed one in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, at the corner of Eighth and Main Street, in the American House Hotel. It was a six-man station uh, commanded by a corporal. And uh, they patrolled uh, all of Monroe County, part of Carbon County, part all of Pike County, and part of Wayne County on horseback. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, starting in 1907. Now, if you look at the picture, uh, the people standing on the steps, you'll see a small boy about in the second row in the uh, lower right. He's uh, standing next to a lady holding a baby. He's four years old in this picture in 1907, and his name is Boyd Weiss. And he ultimately ended up owning the American house in uh, the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Now, these, the barracks itself moved next door to the American house property. There was a, uh, an old English Tudor house between the American House property and the Colonial Diner at the time. Uh, and that's where the barracks moved to, but they still ate their meals at this, at uh, the American House Hotel. They were there for several years. Now, one thing I'd like to do is give credit. There are, there are three, uh, three of these photos in existence. We have uh, one at the museum, I have one, uh, and uh, another person has one, but I wanna acknowledge uh, the people that have made this type of artifact possible. Uh, my dad and myself and a man named Al Hertz uh, were very good friends. Uh, and uh, uh, Al was a uh, policeman up in the Wyoming Valley. And in the 40s, he moved to Stroudsburg and uh, uh, was a bus driver for March Trailways. And he... Uh, uh, then owned a, a taxi company across from the uh, railroad in uh, East Stroudsburg. Uh, when he died, uh, he left his entire collection 
of photos, artifacts, memorabilia to two people. I was one of them. And the other was his nephew, who was Richard Goldberg, who was the uh, attorney general for Pennsylvania under Governor Ray Schaefer. So Al Hertz is the one that originally owned this picture. Now, the other one is owned by Paul Ace, who owns Ace Trucking on uh, North 9th Street in Stroudsburg. Al Hertz's wife, by the way, for any of you that uh, uh, know the family, his wife's named Jerry. And across the street from the American house, she had Jerry's dress shop. So the first recruits on the job were primarily honorably discharged veterans because they were faithful to the United States. They were accustomed to strict discipline and rules and regulations. And it's still that way today. As a matter of fact, we always had a joke on the job that you could not walk from the barracks to the patrol car without violating a rule or regulations. Uh, used to working long hours, obviously, courageous when confronted by dangerous such situations, which is the nature of the job. And recruits weren't allowed to be married. Now, in those years, uh, they had two-year enlistments. And this uh, lasted up until 1964, actually. And uh, a recruit was not permitted to be married when he came on the state police, nor for his first enlistment of two years. During the second two years, he could request permission to be married and uh, request the commissioner in writing. And uh, if the commissioner approved it, uh, then he could get married. The caveat is, is that the prospective bride had to undergo a background investigation. And if she passed, everything was fine. If she failed, it wasn't fine. Well, when I graduated from the academy, I went to Troop R, Dunmore, which is a suburb of Scranton. And I became friends with uh, uh, this one local police chief up there uh, and just stopping and saying hello every now and then because we back each other up. And uh, he said, you know, Mike, I, and he had come on a job in about the 40s. Uh, he was older when, uh, when I was there. Uh, he said, you know, Mike, I was a state trooper once. And I said, you were, why'd you leave? And he said, well, I got married. I said, oh, okay, well, I dropped it. And I went back to the uh, Dunmore Barracks. Uh, it was the end of my shift and we were at change of shifts. And I said, what's up with this fellow that uh, said he used to be on the job? And they said, oh yeah, he was. Uh, he requested to get married. Uh, the crime section did a uh, background investigation on the prospective bride and she failed and she really failed and he married her anyway and he was gone the next day and that's how it was in those days there was no no arbitration or any of that we were issued two uniforms one winter one summer and uh, they were identical to the royal irish constabulary which is this uh, photo here uh, the They were a dark military tunic and riding breeches. Now we call them a blouse. And uh, when I was on, we also wore a strap from the weapon over the left shoulder, and that's called a Sam Brown strap. Uh, they, uh, they still uh, wear the blouse today or the tunic, uh, but only for formal ceremonies. So dark military tunic and riding breeches. Black pigskin puttees, which are the leather devices around the uh, calf, and that's to uh, protect the rider, the inside of the rider's uh, uh, calf area from uh, chafing because of riding again, rubbing against the saddle. Uh, reinforced black bobby helmet. I'd like to talk about this just for a second. If you see that badge in the center of the bobby helmet, uh, that's called a Brunswick star. And it uh, originated, uh, most of the uh, police departments and fire departments in the UK wear them, wear these Brunswick stars. There's an eight point and a 16 point. Uh, our department developed the eight point. Actually, they originated originally in Hanover, Germany, but uh, they became famous in the UK. So as part of the Royal Irish Constabulary, uh, that was at the center of the, of the uh, Bobby Helmet. Now, 
And the next thing is the leather strap, uh, which I'd like to address. Uh, if you can see there, he's wearing it between his lower lip and his chin. And we still do that today with a winter hat. Um, the summer hat is, uh, the strap is behind our head, uh, behind, uh, behind the occipital bone. Uh, but the winter hat is worn the same way or is supposed to be worn the same way as this. The reason is that in a confrontation of large numbers of people, if that strap was under his chin, somebody would be able to grab that helmet from behind and pull it and choke him. Whereas if it's between the lower lip and the chin, the helmet will just come off. Now, you'll see pictures of people not wearing, not wearing it the right way, but this is the way it's supposed to be worn. The black horse hide gauntlets, which are the gloves with the uh, leather forearm protectors, 38 caliber Colt revolver with a six inch barrel. Uh, this is actually what I was issued uh, when I came on in 1969. And uh, it was within our department for 75 years, from 1905 to 1980. 1980, we went to the Sturm Ruger stainless 357 then to the Beretta uh, nine millimeter, then to the Glock nine millimeter. And now the uh, troopers carry the SIG 45, the, uh, the SIG Sauer 45 caliber P227 semi-automatic. Uh, 45 caliber Springfield trapdoor carbine rifle. These were single shot. Uh, they were government surplus that we received them and the standing uh, a uh, joke on the job was uh, that uh, the 7th Cavalry under General George Custer carried these at the Little Bighorn. They didn't do him much good, so we got them. Uh, the nightstick, and you'll see a picture of one on a horse and the horse. The horses were purchased from the uh, government at $115 a horse and shipped uh, from Fort Worth, Texas. Now, this photo on the lower uh, left side here. This is Corporal William Hanna and his horse is Allah. Now, Hanna was in Troop A Greensburg. The horses were all named uh, beginning with the first letter of the troop. In other words, this is Allah and Troop A. If it was Troop B, it would be Buster Billy. And troop C would be Charlie and so on and so forth. These are Mustangs and these are what uh, I rode when, uh, when I went through. Up until 1985, every state policeman that has gone through the uh, academy has been required to become an expert horseman. Uh, in 1985, that was done away with. Uh, but uh, up until then, every trooper that you've seen uh, that's older uh, had to become an expert horseman. Now, um, Allah was shot in the right side of the neck during a demonstration and riot in Fayette County, which is in the southwest corner of the state. These Mustangs, and that's what we rode as cadets, uh, they stand about 12 uh, hands high. A hand is four, in, uh, four fingers, and you measure from the withers, which is the back of the horse's neck where it meets the back down to the ground. And that's how you develop the, uh, the height of a horse. The Mustangs are all about 12 hands. Now, we don't have them anymore. We, ha we have draft horses and uh, the state won't even look at them unless they're a minimum of 16 hands high. There's some big boys. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the Mustangs weighed about 1,200 pounds and the draft horses weigh about 2,500 pounds. And they be quickly become your partner, and boy, is that true. You're with them all the time. The, the horse in those years also functioned as the trooper's muscle when confronted by unruly crowds. Two objectives that you always have on a horse is you never let go of the reins and you never get off the horse because the horse is your safety. Um, now, if you had a squad of these, uh, these Mustangs like here, and uh, 
they kick that uh, that rear end around and start going sideways through a crowd, do they have the ability to move the amount of people that it would take 10 troopers to move on foot as a line of skirmishers. So it's not a good, uh, particularly with these draft horses today. I mean, these are, these are some big boys. This incident is the one that solidified the Pennsylvania State Police for many years to come. This was a trolley strike in Philadelphia, which started uh, February 19th of 1910. Now, between 1905 and 1910, and this is probably going to ring a bell to you, there was a huge amount of radical groups to include Communist Party, uh, that type of thing, that tried to do away with the state police. And they did it by defunding the state police. That was their goal. And there was a large number of groups that did that. Well, when this incident happened, uh, first of all, in 1906, we had, when they started doing this, 1906, we had our first two troopers killed. So then it kind of backed off a little bit. Then they started up again. And then in 1909, we had two more killed. Uh, and then in 1910, this happened. And this, this was the determining factor here. Now, Penny Packer was no longer governor. So uh, when this occurred uh, in 1910, February the 19th, the mayor of Philadelphia uh, called the governor and requested the National Guard to uh, come quell the riot. It was 6,000 uh, trolley workers that overwhelmed a 3,000 uh, man Philadelphia Police Department and it was out of control. So the governor at that time, and, and as I say, not Penny Packer, at that time, the governor said, I'm not gonna send you the guard. I'm gonna send you the state police. And when they've eaten up the state police, then I'll send you the guard. So he contacted uh, uh, Superintendent Groom, who's on the left here uh, in this picture. Captain Lum, the assistant superintendent is on uh, the right side of the picture. And they took 178 men on horseback uh, and went to Philadelphia and went to City Hall. They arrived on February 24th, 1910, and they met with the chief of police. And the chief says, now, one of my guys is going to work with one of your guys. And that's all he got out of his mouth because Groom held up his hand and he said, no, that's not going to happen. My men stick together. My men work for me. And uh, we're not going to be involved in any other form. We know what we're doing together. Uh, we train together. And uh, so we're gonna work together. Now, where's your problem? And the uh, mayor or the uh, chief of police said Kensington. So this is a picture of them riding into Kensington in a column of twos, looking straight ahead at the position of attention on the horse, 178 strong. When they got into Kensington, they divided up into squads and they broke the riot in three days. Uh, nobody was killed after they arrived. Nobody was killed and they all went back to their troops. Now, this made national news at the time. And in addition to that, Teddy Roosevelt uh, came to inspect the troops at Wyoming. And the photo is in your I think it's your Fanlight magazine uh, regarding this presentation. Uh, if you see that photograph, that was Teddy Roosevelt uh, when he came to inspect the troops at, uh, at Wyoming after this uh, incident happened. Now, Roosevelt was no longer president. He, he served from 1901 uh, when President McKinley was assassinated to 1909 but he was still a big supporter of the state police because he's the one that in effect suggested that this state police be formed. He was very proud of our department. So once he then inspected our troops, then it really went nationwide and all the defund the state police went away. Now this picture, I just put this in here because of two things. First, so you can see the length of the riot stick 
at that uh, on the left side of the horse there, it's a lot longer than the batons that were issued today. And secondly, the uh, badge. Uh, the Pennsylvania State Police does not wear a badge. We, we are one of the few departments in the country that uh, don't do that. Our patch is our sign of authority. We carry our badge, still do, uh, even as a retiree. But uh, in those years, the uh, troop commanders would allow in the summertime, because of the weight of the tunic, they would allow them to patrol without the tunic but they had to wear a badge for identification. Troopers patrolled alone on horseback, riding up to 25 miles a day and had to handle any situation. Uh, now, there were also a couple of things that played in with this. They didn't have ro uh, radios on the, on the uh, patrol cars in those days. Those patrol cars ate oats. Um, but they would say, for example, they would leave the American house to go on patrol and let's say they were going to Delaware Water Gap. Well, a Mustang walks at three miles an hour. So Delaware Water Gap being a little more than three miles, uh, you would assume it would be an hour to get there, although going up a hill such as Foxtown Hill it might take a little longer than that. At any rate, when a trooper arrived at his first location, he had to uh, go into a post office business uh, store, a restaurant, bar, whatever, uh, and have the operator sign his daily report to show that he'd been there. Uh, that's how, that's how uh, troopers were supervised in those days. So then he would leave Delaware Water Gap and he would go to Minnesink Hills and he would do the same thing there and then Shawnee and so on and so forth. So if he left the American house uh, to go on patrol, uh, the only way that uh, they could communicate with him was to know where he was going to be next. So his first stop was the post office, we'll say, in Delaware Water Gap. So he left 30 minutes ago, and uh, the desk officer would contact the post office in uh, Delaware Water Gap and tell him when he gets there, call the barracks because he's got an incident for him. That was how the communications was handled in those days. They rode alone, we still do. <clears throat> except when they're going on warrant service or something like that, something a little dangerous. And that's a picture of two of them. Now, the next thing was training. Um, from 1905 to 1910, we didn't have any training. We had, uh, uh, for example, a, a new hire would just report to the, to the troop and he'd ride with a senior guy for uh, a few days and then he'd be cut loose. Um, now, the original enlistees, all of them, uh, all enlisted on December 15th, 1905. So anybody that would come after that was assigned to one of those people. Now, from 1910 then to 1920, Captain Groom moved the troop headquarters, Troop C headquarters, from Reading to Pottsville. And that's this where you see the uh, lower left there. That's Pottsville. Now they sort of developed a training scenario, but here's how it worked. Say for example, I went in and I was on patrol one day, but I didn't really have anything to do and a new hire come in, I would teach them search and seizure. Now let's say the next day, uh, Amy was on patrol and she didn't have anything to do. She would teach laws of arrest. That's pretty much how it went between 1910 and 1920. The first dedicated training school we had it was in 1923, and it was in the Big Spring Hotel in Newville, Pennsylvania. We were there three years, uh, and it was a disaster, but it was the first time we had a cadre to conduct training for new hires. Uh, it, was, it was filthy dirty, it was infested with rodents and so on and so forth. So the state was looking to move out of there and a fellow by the name of Milton Hershey got word of that. And he contacted him and he said, you know, I have this old farmhouse in Hershey. Uh, I won't charge you anything. You can move in there uh, and conduct your training. And that's exactly what happened. The state police cadre then moved in 1924 to uh, the old farmhouse, which is on Cocoa Avenue in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And that's where the uh, training school was for many, many years. Uh, 
So Milton Hershey died in 1945, but Hershey Trust uh, took over his estate uh, and his holdings, still has them actually. Um, and when we decided, uh, our department decided that we wanted to build a new state-of-the-art academy, uh, Hershey Trust got a hold of them and said, you know, you guys have been a fixture around here for so long, we hate to see you leave. Uh, we'd like to make you an offer you can't refuse. And uh, here it is. We have 28 acres of land on a hill outside of Hershey. Uh, it overlooks Hershey. You can smell the chocolate and we'll sell that 28 acres of land to you for $1. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. Uh, they sold the state 28 acres of land uh, for a dollar and the new academy was built and it was copied uh, off the United States Military Academy at West Point. So in this 1924 to 1928 scenario, it was a training school and the new hire's rank was called student recruit. Uh, but now, since we were patterned after the United States Military Academy at West Point from 1960 on, the new hire's rank is cadet. Now this is something that every state policeman uh, has to do. Uh, General order number 14 in 1929 under Superintendent Lynn Adams uh, required this call of honor to be memorized by each trooper uh, and when you think about it, every trooper that you've ever met uh, has had to memorize and live this call of honor. And it says, I am a Pennsylvania state policeman, a soldier of the law. To me is entrusted the honor of the force. I must serve honestly, faithfully, and if need be, lay down my life as others have done before me, rather than swerve from the path of duty. It is my duty to obey the law and to enforce it without any consideration of class, color, creed, or condition. It is also my duty to be of service to anyone who may be in danger or distress and at all times so conduct myself that the honor of the force may be upheld. That particular oath has no expiration date. Once you take it, the only way it's taken from you is when you die. The call of honor was a basis for our conduct and all cadets must recite the call of honor to a commissioned officer before they can graduate from basic training. Now I'm gonna briefly cover this, but uh, we actually have a, a 50 minute program uh, that we do. This is also part of what we uh, teach the cadets, but uh, their program is quite a bit longer because we get into some tactical things that we don't talk about uh, uh, to the, as far as the regular program is concerned. But these are the first two troopers that were killed in the line of duty. Uh, Private John Henry was the first, Private Zeringer was the second, and it occurred during a violent confrontation with members of the Black Hand Society in Florence, Jefferson County, um, about six miles from Punxsutawney. Uh, near two soft coal mines. Uh, this is a troop photo uh, before they were killed. Uh, private, that's Henry over there and that's Zeringer over there. This is Florence, this is a powerhouse and across the street from this powerhouse is where this uh, violent confrontation occurred. Um, there were two troopers killed, two troopers wounded a uh, 14-year-old uh, boy who got caught in the crossfire was wounded and all of the members of the Black Hand were killed. There was 1,400 shots exchanged, 900 by uh, our department, 500 by the Black Hand. This uh, man's name is Homer Chambers. Uh, he, he was wounded eight times uh, in this gunfight. That's a better uh, picture of the... Uh, Brunswick star on the uh, Bobby helmet there. The D11, by the way, that's not his badge number. Uh, 
it's his ID number for the troop. It's Troop D, and his pay number was 11. Uh, that's Captain Joseph Robinson. Uh, if you look in the Fanlight magazine, you'll see him standing uh, right to the right of Teddy Roosevelt. It would be the left as you're looking at it, but he's standing to Teddy Roosevelt's right. He's the one that ended the, the, uh, the incident at Florence. These are five of the survivors that have been promoted. And uh, uh, as I say, if you ever want uh, a presentation on that, it takes about 50 to 55 minutes. This is the only attack dog we ever had. His name is Omar and he's a Belgian Malinois. Um, and his handler uh, was a fellow named uh, Sergeant Tim McCarthy, who was actually born in Europe, in England. Uh, this is a picture of Omar in front of the uh, uh, training school on Cocoa Avenue in Hershey. If you see the guide on on the upper right, let, you know, let's call it a flag. Uh, ST on the top means school troop. SPF means state police force. And there you get a better look at the uh, Sam Brown belt uh, from the weapon to the over the left shoulder that I was telling you about. Uh, that's Sergeant McCarthy and Omar. Omar was quite athletic. Uh, he could jump over an eight foot wall. And what happened, uh, they were sent to, uh, out of Chambersburg, Fulton County, they were sent to uh, uh, serve a 302 commitment on this man. His name is Marshall Lodge. Uh, he was a violent 280 pound, 300, uh, six foot three uh, individual. Uh, a 302 commitment, and they still serve them today. Uh, it's if a person is suspected of being a danger to himself or somebody else, they are involuntarily committed to a mental institution for a period of 72 hours for an evaluation to determine if they are or not. That was the type of uh, paper that was being served on Mar Marshall Lodge. As it turned out, he killed uh, Sergeant McCarthy. Omar was chasing him all through the house. He shot Omar twice, once in the stomach and once in the leg. And he shot and wounded another trooper named Russell Nyes. Ultimately, the detail uh, shot uh, this individual in the right shoulder to the extent that he had to uh, have his right arm amputated. He was ultimately taken into custody and uh, sentenced to uh, Farview State Hospital for the remainder of his life in Waymark. Uh, that's uh, Lynn Adams at uh, McCarthy's funeral. And that's the funeral. And again, uh, either the Henry Zeringer incident which is 50 to 55 minutes, or this incident, if you would ever like a program on that, we can do them separate and I can go into a lot of detail for you. That's McCarthy's uh, gravestone. <coughs> Excuse me, this is the uh, veterinarian that saved Omar's life. Um, Omar then became part of our state police rodeo, uh, which uh, would, occurred from 1921 to 1974. Uh, and Omar became part of the act. Uh, he also received the Medal of Valor, uh, the only four-legged animal on the state police ever to receive the Medal of Valor. He looks a little bored in that picture as he's getting ready to receive his medal. Um, but there he is getting it pinned on him at a troop drill. And they wrote a book about him, Omar, the state police dog. And that's his new handler after McCarthy died. Uh, this was a, a corporal uh, that took over. That's Russell Nyes. He was the trooper that was wounded that day. He ultimately uh, rose to the rank of major and retired in 1963. And Omar, as I mentioned, became part of the rodeo and uh, he was kicked by a horse in the head but everybody thought he was okay. So he went to the rodeo uh, in Butler that year and uh, uh, collapsed and developed a brain hemorrhage and uh, had to be put down. And that's Omar. Now we have dogs today, uh, no attack dogs. 
We have uh, drug sniffing dogs, bomb sniffing dogs, and cadaver dogs. And just a quick story, a couple of years ago, there was a, uh, an incident uh, drowning victim. Um, so our dog handler went out in the boat uh, and when the, uh, was in 35 feet of water and uh, in a pond. And uh, when the, uh, the boat got over top the victim who was on the bottom, uh, 35 feet of water, the dog alerted, sent the divers in and retrieved the body. They're pretty, they have a pretty fantastic sense of smell. Okay, the first vehicles were Harley Davidson's uh, purchased in 1920. And that's them right there. We had 70 of them and uh, they doubled the patrol zone. The patrol zone normally ran for 25 miles a day on a horseback. This could double the patrol zones up to 50 miles a day. So it was an improvement. Uh, this uh, car here is the first marked car we ever have, we ever had. And I usually tell the cadets, if you can name this car, I'll give you the weekend off. So far, nobody's done. Um, and we've been doing this for many, many years. Uh, it's a Hudson Terraplane. The only time that the state police ever had Hudson's. The uh, 1938, we went to Plymouth. And ever since then, it's been Plymouth, Dodge, Ford, Chevrolet, and sometimes Chrysler. But uh, to date, no cadet has been able to identify that car. And that was called a ghost car because it's colored white. Uh, 1927, state police phased out the use of motorcycles. And a couple things important happened in 1923. First, the Department of State Police, the name Department of State Police was changed to Pennsylvania State Police, which is what it is today. But there's some interruptions in between, as you'll see. Uh, the second thing that was done was the State Highway Patrol was formed. Now they were formed uh, because of the increased motor vehicle use uh, on the highways and their job was to enforce vehicle laws, uh, inspect inspection stations, weigh trucks, give drivers tests, that type of thing. So they, they were not considered a threat. And as such, they worked under PennDOT. Pennsylvania Department of Highways. So if PennDOT had the money, they could hire uh, as many state patrolmen as they wanted uh, because they were not legislatively authorized. Pennsylvania State Police was and is today legislatively authorized. We can't get additions to our complement unless the legislature and the, and the governor approve it. and they rode Indian motorcycles and they had 500 of them. And they were called red wheelers uh, because the uh, motorcycles were red. Now the highway patrol did wear a badge. So if you see old pictures of, you now this is a blouse here or a tunic. Uh, if you see old pictures with somebody wearing a badge on a tunic or a blouse, uh, that's a highway patrolman. Now in 1937, the Highway Patrol was merged with the state police to create the Pennsylvania Motor Police. That, was, uh, that lasted until 1943. Now, up until 1937, the leader of the state police was called the superintendent. As of 1937, with the merger, when the Motor Police was formed, that changed to commissioner. So the first uh, commissioner uh, was a man named Percy Foote, who was a retired US Navy Admiral. And he was the first outsider ever to take the helm of the uh, state police. And the reason that they picked him was they didn't wanna pick a person from the highway patrol or a person from the state police because of animosity that may exist. Percy Foote only lasted until 1939 and then Lynn Adams, who was superintendent from 1920 to 1937 came back 
and stayed until 1943 when the name reverted back to Pennsylvania State Police. So Lynn Adams is the only person in history ever to be a superintendent and a commissioner of the Pennsylvania State Police. Now this is the last slide, uh, but this is an important one. When I came on, uh, we had we were a keystone uh, with uh, Pennsylvania State Police in, in the uh, center of the patch. So what was happening in the late 60s and 70s, there were departments that were trying to look like ours. And they were getting jammed up. Now our guys would too, our guys would get jammed up, but this was by the thousands throughout the state. Uh, we were getting complaints. The uh, criminal investigation section, which is now BPR, would investigate the complaints and they say, hey, it's not our guy, it's this guy. So in 1985, because of all these complaints, and there were thousands, Commissioner Jay Cochran decided to form a committee to develop our own patch based on our history and mission. Um, and I furnished a guy from Swiftwater, a trooper, uh, to go to Harrisburg. He was part of the development of this. Um, and, uh, and this is the patch that they came up with, which is still worn on the uniform today. And it's based, as I said, on our history and our mission. The Pennsylvania State Police on the top speaks for itself. The black background shows that we were founded as a direct result of the great anthracite coal strike in 1902. The trooper on the bottom indicates that we're all troopers first, no matter what our rank, no matter what our specialty. It's much akin to in the Marine Corps or the Army, uh, when things turn bad, we're all infantry first, or we're all riflemen first. That's what this trooper means. The gold emblazoned keystone uh, shows that we uh, protect and serve and enforce the laws within the uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the Keystone State. The Commonwealth crest in the center the two horses facing each other with the eagle on top uh, indicates unity. It means that we're unified uh, in our efforts to protect and serve the people of Pennsylvania. The silver starburst you see is the outside of the Brunswick star worn on the bobby helmet by the first 228 troopers of Pennsylvania. And the red in the center uh, is to honor the blood that's been shed by the 99 troopers that have been killed in the line of duty. Um, so anybody that has earned the right to wear that patch has proven beyond any doubt that they have the will, the courage, the intelligence, and the stamina to protect and serve the people of the state of Pennsylvania. And that concludes the presentation, but before I turn it back to Amy, I would like very much to thank my uh, longtime dear friend, Bonnie Rudeski, for uh, her efforts in making this program come to fruition. And also I wanna thank Amy and Tanya and Julia for their excellent expertise with the operation of Zoom. So thank you, ladies. Thank you, Mike. That was a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot, that's for sure. We certainly appreciate you uh, you taking Thank the you time for the opportunity and sharing your your experiences and this history with us. It really is wonderful. Thank you very much, Amy. Great. Thank you. And thank you all again for attending. Have a great evening.